Hello everyone. In the last video, we learned about um, the first two pages of the reaction sheet. And um, many of these first couple reactions are pretty um, mechanism heavy and they can be understood mechanistically. Um, but once we start going past this page, um, it starts to decrease the amount of reactions that we really have to understand how to do. So I'm just gonna jump right in and um, just talk about some of these reactions. All right, so um, our first reaction sets of, <clears throat> of things that we're doing, first reaction sets of things that we're doing um, has to do with double bond reactions. So we've learned how to substitute things in double bond, we've learned how to form some double bonds, and now we're gonna learn how to oxidize uh, double bonds. So oxidation is increasing the bondage to oxygen, right? So um, essentially you can think of it as increasing oxygen bonds. So we're going to replace these double bonds essentially with individual oxygens, uh, oxygen double bonds. And you can think of this reaction, uh, it's called ozonolysis, right? Double bond cleavage. You can think of this reaction as, kind of if I, t if I draw a double bond, okay, let's say I have some things on it. R group, R group, whatever. And this reaction, I want you to think of it as you split the double bond in half, okay? And let's say we generate two halves. So when I split it in half, there's not there's a dumb way to think of it, okay? Let's say I get these two ends, okay? And I have this side. Okay? And what all we're gonna do is we're gonna add an O. So think of it as you cut it in half and then you're putting O's on each side. And that's essentially what um, what this reaction produces. Now there's different strengths of um, oxidation reagents. So we have o ozonolysis using ozone and then we have KMnO4. And KMnO4 is one of our stronger oxidizing reagents. So what that means is over here I have all uh, R chains, right? But let's say I didn't have an R chain. Let's say instead that this was a hydrogen over here, okay? What that means is on this side, instead of it being just a hydrogen, it's gonna be an OH. So it's gonna get fully oxidized, okay? So if there's a hydrogen over here, it gets fully oxidized. And let's say in the case that on the side of the double bond, say I have R groups over here, and let's say I had two hydrogen groups over here. Okay, when I perform this with KMnO4, right, and make sure you look at the conditions. The conditions are warm, okay? Remember how before we had cold and basic. So there's different conditions that oxidize to a certain degree. So this one only produces two alcohols, doesn't cleave the double bond, and this one will actually cleave the double bond and add carbonyls. So whenever I have, I'm using a strong oxidizing reagent, okay, and there's a heat, and if I have two hydrogens on the same side, just the one thing you need to be careful of that we'll get this. So we'll get the oxygen like this, and obviously you have OH, and you have OH. But this is unstable, and what this does, this is reduces to H2O plus CO2. And what happens essentially is you have a kind of decarboxylation. So this is going to come take this proton and then a lone pair is going to come over here and form a bond over here and this is going to get kicked off. Okay. Don't need to understand it, but just know this will decompose into H2O and CO2. Okay. So if you have two hydrogens and you have a strong oxidizing agent, it will decompose into H2O and CO2. All right. Um, so that's that reaction. So these two reactions do the same thing, right? So they're just different. One is a stronger oxidizer than the other. So ozonolysis will only, whenever you have hydrogens, it will keep it as hydrogens, right? But when you have KMnO4, it will uh, continue oxidizing that to alcohol. And then if you have two, it will be decomposed to CO2 and H2O. All right? So that's not too hard. And you'll have uh, these reactions repeated again for triple bonds, and it'll be the same thing, essentially, just a little bit different. All right? And then we have the carbene carbonoid addition. So uh, formation of cyclopropane. And essentially 
you don't need to know the, the 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 mechanism for this, but all you need to know is that I'm going to form this kind of uh, triangle-like structure, right? The cyclo structure um, whenever I have CH2N2 or CHI2. So you need to know the things that go with each of these reactions, but in the end, ultimately they produce the same thing. So I produce the CH2 in this kind of um, this kind of triangle-like form that we've seen before. Okay, so that's what these do. Now let's look at a very important reaction: um, the oxidation of alkenes, oxyurane synthesis. Okay, so this forms an epoxide. Okay, um, an epoxide essentially when you have the O uh, like this, this this kind of structure. That's an epoxide. And um, essentially, what we what we what we use is double bond. Remember, we have a double bond, and we have what we use MCPBA and CH two Cl two. And what this will do, this will just turn the double bond into an epoxide. Okay, and um, this is very important whenever we learn how to do other other reactions that we're going to see down here. Um, and it'll be really uh, common to use in uh, synthesis and. Uh, and the reactions from time to time. All right, so this is just a memorization. That's something you need to memorize and just know that it forms this O in this sort of triangle-like structure that we've seen before many times. All right, so if we move on, a lot of these are just memorization, but some of them are can be learned. Now, these are two that can be learned. So we'll look at opening of epoxide. So we just learned how to make an epoxide. Now we're going to learn how to react with it. So there's two conditions in which that we can um, react with these uh, epoxides. So I'm just going to uh, heal this really quick. Okay. And let's go to our notes. All right. And we're going to look at these two conditions. Okay. So there's acidic conditions and there's basic conditions, right? So obviously, you can tell the first one is acidic, the second one is basic, right? And notice the steps, right? So this step two means after I've reached equilibrium from the fir adding this first uh, reagent, then I add the second reagent, not that I add one, then the other. They're, they're not together at the same time, right? Um, so this is acidic conditions is basic conditions, and they they behave differently. And what I mean to behave differently is that they're going to give you unique products. So when I'm in the acidic condition, right, I am lowering, I'm lowering the pH, right, and that means that um, almost everything will be protonated. So anything that can be protonated, I'm going to protonate it. And so in this case, I have an oxygen, and the oxygen will be protonated. Right. If I'm lowering the acidity, the the pH, I mean, increasing the acidity and lowering the pH. So what that will do, that will give me. I'm just gonna draw this like this. And draw this like this. Okay. So now this is positive. And what did we say about um, whenever you make electronegative atoms positive? We we said that. When we make things that are electronegative positive, they're going to draw on the, the sigma bonds that they're uh, attached to more strongly. So this oxygen is now more um, is more uh, in need of, okay? So whenever this oxygen is positive now, these are going to be, uh, sigma bonds are going to be pulled on far strong, uh, much more strongly, right? And these are going to become partially positive locations, okay? And just like we saw before, right, um, the carbon that is partially positive that is more substituted is going to be more partially positive, okay? So this top carbon is going to be more partially positive because it has this it's a tertiary carbon versus the one down here. It's only secondary. And so that means this carbon over here is going to be more partially positive, and that means it's going to be more receptive, right, to being attacked, right? So the water at this point is going to come and is going to attack the more substituted side, right? And that means it's going to get kicked off. So have all this. So this side, stereochemistry is going to become inverted. So that means the water is going to be on a light wedge. And then my CH3 is on a dark wedge. 
Okay, and then down here, the stereochemistry is going to be retained. And so I have this OH. And now all I need to do is deprotonate, so another water. Damn it. Okay, he's going to take one of these hydrogens, and I'm going to make the oxygen neutral. And I get my product at that point. Okay, so you don't need me to draw it. We'll just look at it. So it starts off like this, and it, the top is now inverted. So the CH3 is on dark wedge, like I was about to draw, right? And the oxygen is on light wedge. And so this is what we're going to get. So the top one is going to be, right, uh, attacking from, uh, it's going to be a mark substitution. Mark substitution and the, the, the acidic condition and antiplanar. Okay, and then the bottom one is going to behave differently, right? So now I'm using a strong base, right? These are basic conditions, and what's going to happen is this ox, this O minus, right, is instead of waiting for the right opportunity um, when when things are more partially positive and I have good sites to be attacked, they're more electrophilic, right? Over here I have these carbons that get attacked that are more uh, electrophilic, right? that lets something like a weak nucleophile or weak base like water or anything come and attack. But when I have a strong base in this case, so OOH, it can come and attack on its own. And when it attacks on its own, we're going to be following more of SN2-like rules. And so that means when it's attacking on its own, it's going to attack the least substituted side and pushing this off. Okay, so it's attacking the least substituted side, it is less steric hindrance, it's more available, right? These sites are not partially positive, very partially positive, so that's not going to be taken into account. So this same reasoning that we're using before is not taken into account here. All we're looking at is steric hindrance. So the oxygen is going to attack from the side that's less substituted. And this bond is going to break and kick this off. And on the bottom, we have this the stereochemistry is going to be flipped. So on the light wedge, I have the OH that was added. This is the new one. And then on the dark wedge over here, I have the D. I, I like saying dark wedge and light wedge. And also a uh, small remark. Apparently she didn't like my method of doing the light and dark wedges, even though pretty obvious to me which one is was dark and which one's light, which one's a dash. I just never like drawing dashes, but apparently now she's going to give you a hard time if you don't draw the dashes. So just draw the annoying dashes from now on, right? Whatever. Voila. Um, so just make sure you do that. Anyways, um, so the bottom is going to have the stereochemistry flipped. And then the top, this is just going to come up and this is going to be retained over here. So I have the CH3. And then I have the OH, right? But it's not OH yet, it's O minus. Because I, I, I gave this oxygen another pair of electrons. So this is O minus over here. And this is where the second step comes in. So after I complete the first step and after I've reached equilibrium, I'm going to add hydrogen, right? And it's important because I have to do this first because I don't want to make this acidic condition. So I, I need to separate and make, make sure that I'm either doing basic or acidic. And that's why I have to add the H plus last after everything is done, right? I can't have everything there together, obviously. It wouldn't, it would have a bunch of side reactions and things that I don't want to happen. So second step, after I've reached equilibrium and I've had a lot of this product is forming, now that I have a lot of these, I'm gonna introduce the, hi the hydrogen, right? The hydronium uh, ions, right? And he's gonna get protonated. And then, you know, we just get our product, whatever. I don't need to draw it. So our product is, now the top is retained, right? So the top is retained. So CH3 is on light, we uh, light wedge or whatever, dash. And this is on dash, right? And then the bottom, the stereochemistry is, inver uh, is uh, inverted. So this was dark wedge. D used to, deuterium used to be on light. Now it's on dark. 
and the OH was what was added. Okay, and they're color coding things very nicely for you. So you know this is the OH that was in red. It's the red is added over here, and then the hydrogen in blue is being added over here. So they're they're kind of showing you a little bit in this reaction sheet, um, kind of what's happening a little bit. So um, just 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 be familiar with this. this is going to come up, and it's going to come up again or go to um, in the first exam. So if you understand it now, all the better for you. Moving on, um, we're going to look at more kind of ring triangle like structures, right? Cyclopropane like structures and formation of dibromocarbenes and dichlorocarbenes. And essentially another set of reactions where you add these things and we form these little triangle structures. Essentially, you're going to take a carbon and two of these halides. So a carbon and two of these halides, and we're going to attach the carbon and then two of the halides are gonna be coming off. So CCl2, CBr2, okay? And just know it's with KOH and it just, it says please look up the mechanism, but you don't really need to know the mechanism. It will never be relevant really later. Um, it's interesting if you look it up, um, but not super important. Okay, uh, now some interesting stuff. Okay, so I'm going to rant for a little bit about this right here. This is going to be uh, important. All right, um, let's look at this. Now I just want to want everyone to understand. So if you if you're really good with the acid and base stuff, this should make perfect sense to you, right? So um, ignore this line. This is the the mouse thing, but um, what we have over here is one of our strong how to form one of our strong bases. So if you remember from test two, one of our strong bases that we used was the acetylide anion, right? So we take any you know, R, C, triple bond, C. And if it's a terminal, and you have this negative charge over here, this uh, forms a, is a strong base that we can use for E2, right? And so this is essentially what we come from. So uh, any alkyne, this is an alkyne, a terminal alkyne. Alkyne just means triple bond. And I use a strong base to form it, right? So this is the formation of this alkyne. Now, essentially what was happening here, if what I want to show everyone is just, um, we need to understand the relative strengths of the bases. So if I'm using NaNH2 to form the acetylide anion, does that mean, which one is the stronger base? Is it NaNH2 or is it the acetylide anion? It's the NaNH2, right? We forget the Na, Na but NH2. If I'm using something to form a, uh, another base, so if I'm using a base to turn uh, an acid into its conjugate base, that means that the base that I use is the stronger one, right? I wouldn't be able to form this and, and form NH3 and get good amount of product if this was not more stable than, uh, the, uh, than NH2. So this is the stronger base and this is the weaker base. Okay, so I use the stronger base to deprotonate this and I form this one, which is not as strong as, as this one over here. Okay, so just just to refresh some of the concepts that we um, talked about before. And so that, that'll be important um, in just kind of uh, maybe in a concept section or maybe a reaction. Uh, we always need to think about relative pK value, pK uh, A and pK uh, B values. Okay. So um, we're going to look at some of the uses of the acetylide anion and some we know and some uh, we don't know. So the first two are some that we should know. So the first one is acetylide anion, AKA a strong base used with a primary alkyl halide, right? And what did we say a strong base does in the presence of a primary alkyl halide? It doesn't do E2, it does SN2. So this is just SN2. And we have this substituted on the CH3. And that's what we have in the product, right? SN2. And then when we have secondary and tertiary, then I have E2. And we form the most substituted double bond. So the first two you should be very familiar with, right? 
But the third one is something that we haven't really done yet. So um, if I do the third one, right? So what we have, this is, so we have this thing called the carbonyl, okay? And they can be of two different forms. They can be ketones, and we have aldehydes, okay? My two favorite molecules, all right? Functional groups. So over here, I have drawn out a ketone. A ketone essentially is a R group, so any carbon group. Then I have a carbonyl. A carbonyl is any C double bond O structure. This is a carbonyl. So R group, carbonyl, and then another R group. This is a ketone. An aldehyde, on the other hand, is I have one R group, and then on the other side, I have a hydrogen. So in terms of reactivity, aldehydes are more reactive, okay? And that is because um, two reasons. The carbonyl carbon is more stabilized inductively by these carbon groups, right? And um, another reason, so obviously this one only has one R group, so it's not as stabilized, right? Because this oxygen is pulling, um, is pulling in this direction and making this carbon over here partially positive, right? Partially positive, partially negative. I have actual resonance structure that gives me those charges. So if I resonate this, this double bond into the oxygen, I get this structure, right? I get O negative and I get this positive, right? And this is where these partial charges come from. So, um, so if I do this, positive, negative. So then I can talk about one reason, which is the stabilization by the R groups, right? So this makes this one more stable than this one over here. A second reason in terms of reactivity, so obviously the more unstable something is, the more reactive it is, right? The more partially positive. So we can say this is like partially positive, positive, and this is only one positive, if you wanted to see it like that. Another thing we can talk about is steric hindrance, and this one is more sterically hindered. So I have two R groups, I have more steric hindrance around this this uh, electrophilic site, right? Because par uh, partially positive or positive charge in electrophilic site. So this is more sterically hindered, while this one over here is not as sterically hindered, just a hydrogen versus a whole R group. So this is just more reactive uh, sterically, right? And um, stability wise as well. So just that's a quick, quick um, overview of uh, carbonyls, right? And so these are going to be important for test two, uh, test three, and uh, especially orgo two, they're going to be um, always um, important. So let's say I have a ketone, or it doesn't matter, ketone or aldehyde. And um, so it doesn't matter, it's gonna draw it like this. And so let's say I introduce my C light anion, right? So I have my R, C, triple bond, C, negative charge, okay? And what this is going to do, this is going to behave as a nucleophile in this case, right? I've introduced it into an environment where I don't really have any um, uh, good hydrogen to abstract, right? It's not gonna act as a base really over here. And we're going to make it act as a nucleophile. And what it's going to do, it's gonna attack the carbonyl carbon because uh, it is an electrophilic site. So it's going to attack from the base and it's going to kick up these electrons into the oxygen. And I'm going to get this product. So I'm going to get the O minus. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have the attachment down here. So I've attached this carbon, which was triple bonded to another carbon, and it has this R group. So I've I have this attachment like this now. And then in the second step, what we're going to do, we're going to add. So this is the first step. And this is the second step. And I'm going to add an acid, right? So we say th either say then H3O plus or right st uh, step two. And H3O plus, right, looks like this. Right like this. And so this is the the very acidic hydrogen right here. And so this O minus is going to come. It's going to take one of those. And then we're going to make this an OH, okay? And that's how we get our product over here. 
So <clears throat> we are going to protonate this and we're going to get the substitution of uh, the acetylide and then we're going to get uh, the alcohol, okay? And so I don't want to get fixated on this and think it has to be the acetylide. We can use a variety, and we're going to see, we're going to, we can use a variety of uh, different nucleophiles to come and attack uh, at the carbonyl. And we're going to see a couple of different examples of that. And essentially what it's going to do, it's always going to form alcohols uh, from the carbonyl uh, after we add the protonation step and the second step. So we're going to add whatever, we're going to attack, and then we're going to protonate the oxygen and we're going to form an alcohol. And that's what we always end up doing. So we have these reactions over here. And I think it probably would be a good point to um, probably stop for now. But as you can see, we're going to start doing um, triple bond uh, chemistry now. So we're going to finish with our, our double bonds. We actually already started triple bonds <laughs> um, uh, with acetylide. But um, a lot of this stuff over here now is going to be a lot of memorization. And you'll see that a lot of stuff uh, repeats. So we have HBr reactions. It's very similar. Right? I have a Br2 reaction. It's very similar. Uh, I have H2PD. does the same thing. Just fully saturates everything that has excess electron density. So... Triple bond is very electron dense. It's going to fully saturate these two carbons. So hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. That's it. So some repeated things. Um, some new things. Some new things over here. Some new things. Uh, quite a few new things. Right? And then we have more oxidizing reagents. So KMnO4 comes up again. And then we have ozonolysis. And we have uh, more oxidation. And now just this time with uh, triple bond. So there's a lot of repeats. Um, and these, this this part of the reaction sheet is is very simple. So this is why I always always preach: make sure you understand the mechanism. Because when you understand the mechanism, you're getting through a lot of the annoying uh, memorizing that you have to do. And once you get through that, the, I feel that a reaction sheet is very easy afterwards. There's a lot of similarity that you can just immediately see. Instead of having to memorize everything, you can see like, oh, I actually understand this. I can kind of see where this is coming from. There's less memorization that you have to do and more of just kind of recall and kind of uh, familiarity, all right? So start working on these two pages. And so um, by Monday, I expect everyone to know how to do until page four. And um, from there, uh, it'll be very, very simple. Uh, it doesn't get, doesn't get too complicated after this. So it's pretty nice. All right, best of luck, everyone.